Joey and Brad have spent many, many, many hours researching um, different aspects of the way we behave and, and decision-making processes and different concepts and have applied those to our financial lives and have helped many, many people grow um, in learning about being uh, their, you know, responsible for their finances or just even learning what finances are about. And um, I'm honored to welcome them. I've known them for many years and it's been a joy having that relationship with the two of them and I've learned a lot from them. So Joey, Brad, welcome. Yeah. Thank you so much. Well, Heidi, Eva, thank you. Appreciate the invite. Look forward to the time we're gonna spend this afternoon. Um, I appreciate the intro. Uh, very appropriate. I'll uh, I'll skip to a little bit of the backstory that might be might be interesting as as a setup for today's conversation. Um, Joey and I are both traditionally trained in economics, which is all numbers and statistics driven. And when I was teaching, the textbook was no different. But uh, you know the fallacy of this approach is is the presumption that people make rational decisions, um, and it just obviously doesn't happen all the time. Uh, the story that resonates with me in this area, back in the late 90s, I was met a uh, founder of a dot-com company and I was introduced by their CPA and attorney who were trying to get them to cash in part of the lottery ticket of the, co of the company. And overnight, this person was worth well in excess of $100 million. Uh, can you just take part of this off the table? You're set for life. No, no, no. They called me in to try to convince them to do something other than that. But the person was anchored, over-optimistic. The risk framing was off. They were stuck in status quo and familiarity bias. All things that I didn't truly understand back then. So we fast forward to today. Um, oh, by the way, we, none of us could, could get, them to, get them to move. And unfortunately, in a matter of about 30 days, when the market collapsed, the company collapsed as well. Um, and it all basically disappeared. So fast forward 20 some odd, 20 years, and I meet Joey. So Joey's a Cornell grad. And I look on his resume, he went to the, the Yale Behavioral Finance Program. He's now finishing the Harvard program on the same subject, which is really the culmination of all the, the materials today, the results of, of those programs, plus all of the stuff that he does on the side. Um, the materials that you're going to see today, UCSB recently took a look at it, and they started a new course at UCSB, winner of this coming year in Joey's lecture on something, and they're saying, you created this, you run with it. So there's some unique stuff that's here. Um, so with that, let me introduce you to Joey Corey. Uh, and Joey will take us on a little bit of a journey and we'll have some fun. Thank you, Brad. Thank you, Ava and Heidi. Uh, thank you everybody for taking a little bit out of your Saturday to join us for this conversation. We are passionate nerds about it. Let me get the slideshow up here. So we'll start really with why is it worth everybody's time to care about this topic and why are Brad and I so excited about it? So as financial advisors, our job is to help people expand their wealth, but also have a good framework about what wealth means. We're going to have a little bit of conversation about that today. But in essence, this topic helps reduce poor decision making. It's profitable and it can help make investing a little less stressful. So not only you, but also your wallets should be thanking us by the end of the hour. Uh, and it's good timing this year with a little bit of a market downturn. Hopefully some of the concepts we've talked about today uh, can help make managing the current environment a little easier. How profitable is this uh, field exactly? Actually last year in 2021, there was a paper that came out titled The Value of the Advisor and it found that um, it compared two groups, one group of investors who did not receive any advisor behavioral coaching and the other group that did. And it turns out that the group that was uh, coached with this behavioral economics framework had on average 2% higher annual returns than those that did not. And you may think 2% sounds pretty small. Why care about 
something so tiny, it actually uh, aggregates to be quite a bit over time. So as an example, saving 20,000 a year for 30 years at 8%, you'd have 2.26 million at the end of those 30 years. The same exact time period, if you just earned 2% more every year, you would have ended with 3.3 million, uh, over a million dollars more, over 46% more of the total. So that 2% um, means a lot over long periods of time. And you couple that with the traditional uh, solutions that financial planners like Brad and myself know and, and implement for clients, rebalancing, asset location, the order of how you withdraw uh, from which accounts totals up to about three and a half percent and over of additional benefit per year from the investment perspective. Not only from the investment perspective is it so beneficial, but it also applies to a lot of other areas that aren't related to investments as well. Things like decisions within our families, how we spend our time, and what type of retirement we envision for ourselves. So we'll get into it, but I wanted to share a bit of the journey. And Brad and I can chat about the work we've done since we last joined as hosts on this, this exact platform here with, with Ava and Heidi. We've created what we call the matrix, and we're not as we're not as cool as Keanu Reeves, but we like we like the term. Um, and I'm going to show you what that is. So we start off. I'm going to actually switch what I'm sharing, and I'm going to show you a live version of the matrix. So here's what we've done. And this is the journey, and then this is going to explain how we get to what we're talking about today. We started by reading as many academic papers and as many textbooks as as many materials published in the realm of behavioral economics as possible. And we get a list of the top 100 behavioral finance concepts. So these are some concepts, some of which we may be familiar with. Things like hindsight bias, or if you're a sports fan, the hot hand fallacy. These are mental roadblocks that inhibit our ability of making a good decision. So we get a list of the top 100, and then we start thinking about how they apply to how we are traditionally trained as financial advisors. So a good example is uh, on the investment side, most people think financial planning, they think investments, even though we do much more than that. It's the low hanging fruit and the obvious place to start the discussion. So you have investment planning and you've got some sub areas of the investment planning world. You have buying positions and selling positions, moving to cash and dealing with market movements and changing the allocation of your portfolio, as well as evaluating how performance is done and how we think about that. So Brad and I put our heads together and we're thinking, okay, well, we've got six rough areas in the investment planning world. Which of the, those top 100 behavioral finance concepts apply? And we can actually map over those connections. So when I turn on these, these nodes here, you can start to see this structure that crystallizes where we have investment planning. And now we can look at something like market movements, a key area for this year, and we can start to see the behavioral finance elements that relate to market movements. We've taken this a step further. Instead of just identifying what connects, we also started identifying some solutions for those connections, which as far as we're concerned, nobody on the planet has started doing yet. We can start to see how this gets a little bit uh, confusing for people. So let me show you, let me take you down a walk through the park about how wide our subject area is. And then I'll get to what we're covering on today's call. So we've got investment planning, which is one of the areas of what we do, but maybe you have some positions and you sell them and you're worried about the tax bill. Now we have a whole different world of tax planning. And that covers reducing taxes, delaying taxes, dealing with gains and losses and paying Uncle Sam, something none of us like to do. Other than tax planning, you've got general financial planning. How are we spending and saving money? How do our personalities and our upbringings relate to how we feel about money? What's our relationship with money? More broadly, you have retirement and income planning. Your portfolio is working for something. We wanna eventually retire and use those assets. How does that relate to unexpected future costs or the fear of having enough? What about working by choice or just saving for retirement in general? We can start to see all of the areas of financial planning and how it relates. State planning, giving money, potential family disharmony, receiving assets and gifting assets. Risk management is how we think about risk and probabilities. Do we have the right insurance? Are we overconfident in what risks we're exposed to? 
And then last but not least, something unique to mission wealth is, you know, the, the definition of wealth is not just a financial definition. We actually believe there are many more areas of your life that factor into how wealthy you are. And we call this inspired living, which relates to whether or not you are intellectually pursuing what you're excited about. If your social life is healthy and you're getting the type of social connections that foster personal growth, are you having fun? Is your career on track? Are you in physical health? These areas, while they're not financial, should factor into all of our definition of what wealth is. And a lot of us learned through the pandemic that even though the financial component can be in jeopardy, often we have more time for family or for fun uh, and, and we build stronger emotional connections with those that we know and love. So these should all be factored into our idea of wealth. So Brad and I, we, we map over these general areas and here we are, all seven of them, tax and investments and estates and retirement and risk and inspired living. And, and now we can start to see how connected these behavioral nodes are. So let me give you an example real quick. If you came into our office, or any advisor's office, and you said, hey, Brad, I'm worried about retiring. Do I have enough? OK, there are technical answers to that, uh, solutions that certified financial planners are trained to answer. We can turn on the behavioral nodes, and we can easily start to see what areas relate to having enough or saving for retirement, what hurdles to avoid. But if you're saving for retirement, your investment portfolio also has to sustain you through retirement. So we can turn that on and take a look at the intersection of the two. We can start to see the, the nodes on the outside are the, are the topics that aren't super interconnected, but those on the inside are super connected. And if you're worried about the investments, you're probably worried about risk. We can turn that on. What about spending money in retirement? Do I have enough? Will I outlive my money? We can turn general planning on. And you can start to see how, these, how this web forms and how it can get really confusing. If you add in tax planning and estate planning and then the non-financial elements of our wealth, you get this spider web that clearly shows us how we get confused when we make decisions. So this is what we're going to be talking about today. Instead of going over all of these connections, which would surely put most of you to sleep, even though it's my version of fun, we've picked the top five bullet points of those top 100 lists, and we're going to go over the most important one to three connections. So some areas here, like anchoring, which is one of the topics we're going to cover on today's call, are really connected throughout all of the areas of our financial lives and beyond. So we've picked our top five, and we're just going to go over one or two of these connections for those top five. All told, how wide is this thing? We've got about 400 connections right now. And we're looking to, uh, we're looking to skinny that down a little bit. But it gets pretty wide. OK. Joy, Joy, I'm going to give you the first question. And, and part of this, we, we didn't do it on the setup. Um, this, as we go through this, we'll break it up into little sections here and open up for some questions between um, so we can hit anything that comes up within the group. But my first question to you, Joey, we know there's plenty of textbooks out there that have the behavioral nodes that are listed. Has anyone linked these together like this? Good question. Uh, no. So here's what we see a lot of, uh, here's what we see out there. We see a lot of um, psychologists who are interested in finance and they take what they've learned from the psychology side and they try to apply it to, to the financial world. But all they know about in the financial world is investing. And that's just a little bit because they're not trained financial advisors. What we've done is flip the script a little bit where we looked at how we're classically trained as advisors and we've connected that to this tiny sliver of psychology that, that is behavioral economics of decision making. Then we've taken it one step further actually. Not only have we made these connections that nobody else has made, but we've also connected solutions to each one. And the idea there is, you know, if you meet with your financial advisor and you say, I'm worried about the stock market and they say, oh, what you're dealing with is X, Y, and Z bias. So what? Thanks for telling me it has a name, but how do I deal with it? So we've actually started to model both technical and non-technical solutions to all of these various connections. Good question, Brad. 
for the layout of today's talk, when, when we go through, we have a top five that we're going to go through, but really we want to go deeper instead of wider for this conversation. So after each, after each node, uh, we're going to open it up to questions and maybe we don't hit all five by the end of the hour, but I'd rather have more of a discussion for each of the ones we can get through instead of rushing to get through all five. Any and questions I, before I, we get going? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I have one because I always have lots of questions for you because I always learn. So I know that we started this project with 400 and I, I, I say we, in, in this is Joey's work. Um, so it started with 400, you got it down to 100. And then of the 100 that came up all the time for the intersections, then how many were there that were had the most common intersection points? Those are, those are what we focused on today. So the five of them really came up all over the place. Um, and then it, and then it break, and then the next subclass was like 14, something like that, right? So out of all these nodes, the reality of it is if everyone on this call understood, and the idea is not that this is a, a way to judge things, it's just a way to understand it so we make better decisions because all these things are impediments to, to making decisions where you see people get stuck, especially if you have to make multiple decisions that are interrelated. Um, so yeah, I, I, so fire away with the, with the top five and I'd uh, love to, go deeper in those. Yeah, absolutely. So the first, uh, the first we're dealing with is, is optimism bias. And it really relates to making decisions about the future. And, and what it is, optimism bias just means we tend to overestimate positive events that would happen to us and we underestimate negative events that would happen to us. And it gets us into a bit of trouble in a lot of different areas. But for the purpose of this call, we're just gonna really focus on three different areas. First, market movements. Brad and I tried to make this call as relevant as possible to current conditions. So there's a fair bit in this presentation about uh, investing in the markets to try to help ease any sort of concerns that may be happening at the current moment. So issue number one with optimism bias is market movements. Even though we know the markets will go up and down and zig and zag, we've all heard it a thousand times, uh, we act as if the market only goes up and then when it goes down, we panic every time. And the data on this is actually really a bit sad, but, but you can see that people sell at the worst time and they buy at the worst time too. So two potential solutions, and Brad, it certainly pick your brain on this. The first that I like to tell clients is, I don't expect clients to have blind faith that the markets are just gonna work in their favor. Instead of asking for blind faith and blind trust, a little bit of understanding goes a long way. And with that understanding, I think knowing that there is a process in place uh, to curb against our over-enthusiastic optimism about the future is really important. So there's really four technical solutions to avoiding optimism bias. And, and the acronym the DART helps us get there. It's diversify, allocate, rebalance, and tax loss harvest. And Brad, we can ping pong back and forth about these, but in short, you know, diversify, we generally don't recommend you hold more than 5% of your assets in one position. Similar to that client Brad started off the conversation with, um, what made you wealthy may not keep you wealthy. Allocate, which we'll talk about a little bit more later on in the presentation, is what percent of your funds are in which vehicles? So what percent of your funds are in equity, like stocks? And what percent of them are in fixed income, like bonds? Within each of those broad categories, you have subcategories, what percent of them are in US stocks versus international stocks. That mix, is just like the recipe of something you're cooking. If you put too much salt, what well, you're cooking isn't gonna taste right. So that mix is really important for getting the portfolio to behave the way you want it to. I'll leave everybody with one question that they could ask their advisors. Mission Wealth does this, but, but many others don't. You could always ask your advisors, are my investments efficient? Which is the technical word, uh, That'll be a good question to ask whether or not you're allocated correctly. And your allocation really determines your risk. Rebalancing means you're systematically selling high and buying low, not the reverse. Our emotions want us to do the reverse. Something goes down, we get scared. I, I want the pain to stop and you sell. Rebalancing means you keep that allocation consistent through time. As the market changes, 
the portion you hold and each asset changes with it. So over time, we go back and we keep that consistency the same. And then lastly, uh, tax loss harvest, where applicable, going in there and intentionally selling positions that are at a loss. Use that tax benefit to keep the assets working for you instead of paying Uncle Sam uh, capital gains in other areas of your portfolio. So those are a little bit four technical solutions on market movements uh, to curb against optimism bias. We never want to take a bet thinking that things will always go in our way in the future. Brad, any commentary there before I move on to issue number two? Yeah, I guess this is where, where especially on individual positions where people tend to get anchored on them because they, they, they don't want to exit even to go into, you know, out of Coke and into Pepsi or vice versa, just because they get stuck in one particular position. And that, that's, that's just another form of bias where you get emotional attachment, which creates, which creates issues, creates stress for sure. Yeah, anchoring is one of the one of the topics we'll hit on. I think it's number three, uh, number three or number four in this presentation, which is certainly one of the most prevalent issues we see um, in people's lives. Optimism bias also hurts with spending and saving. That's issue number two. Uh, we we really underestimate the costs uh, associated with infrequent negative events, and we overestimate how much we can save a year. I think uh, I think most financial advisors would agree with me when I say the the most important variable in the financial plan success is the spending rate. You can have all the money in the world, but if you're spending all of it, it won't last. So we notice that people do something with optimism bias. It's, it's subtle, but they will take their typical month and they'll say, I spend 5,000 a month, you multiply that by 12. My spending should be around 60,000 a year. Um, it's almost always undercutting their actual spending. A study in 2020 found that the average uh, American underestimates their spending by about $7,500 a year. So a safe starting point would be what you typically spend per month, and then you add on $7,500 uh, to the total figure as a safe starting point. And what this really is is that people are bad at estimating they're going to have medical costs or a new water heater or a new roof. And they don't really factor that in because they think about things in a short time frame. For savings, December statements are the most powerful statements, in my opinion. When you first week of January, when you get your December statement, you can pull up that statement and look at how much you saved into your account. What were your contributions or what were your withdrawals? It'll tell you that on, on your December statement. And then lastly, to really curb optimism bias in your spending and saving, you can always hire a bookkeeper. And you could always use tools like commercial banks or Tiller HQ. Most people don't know that commercial banks offer budgeting services if you just pull up your bank account on a desktop and, and click around their platform. Um, in the last five years, most commercial banks have offered budgeting services for free as part of your, your service banking. Tiller HQ is a, something I've, I personally use. It's a spreadsheet-based budgeting tool. Um, for those that are as nerdy as I am to actually use a spreadsheet for your daily transactions. Rule of thumb there for issue number two is we underestimate costs that are infrequent and negative. We overestimate how much we think we can save. So we can factor that into the plan. A good tip here, if you work with an advisor who builds financial plans for you, when modeling your expenses, ask them to add a little bit of a buffer. Murphy's Law, ask them to add 5,000 or 10,000 of buffer every year for that thing that happens that you didn't expect. The last piece on optimism bias, you can see in the top right, is a snapshot of the, the matrix and you can see how connected optimism bias is. We're really only touching on three of these multiple connections. The third one is, is actually non-financial. It's how optimistic we are with regards to our family, our health and our lifestyle. We typically don't expect physical injuries or emotional setbacks or our limited liability, our limited availability, excuse me. And that really gets in the way. It prevents us from spending time with family members, it's, which is one of the most common deathbed regrets, prevents us from prioritizing meaningful relationships and experiencing the world as we wanted to when we imagined uh, having the time to do so. So here's a, couple, um, here's a couple sad statistics, but statistics that are sobering. Um, cancer, the, the Cancer Foundation found that on average, 
um, whether or not you're a man or a woman, you've got about a 39.5% chance to be diagnosed with some form of cancer in your lifetime. You typically gonna need about one year, 69%, you're gonna have 69% of people are gonna need one year or more of long-term care at some point in their life. You've got a 77% chance of getting into a driving accident, about a 40% chance of needing some form of disability coverage. So to plan as if you're gonna have a life that has, these are just four of common issues. I mean, there's, there's millions of ways that you could hit a roadblock in your life. To plan as if none of those happen to you uh, would be a plan that is rooted in optimism bias. The potential solution here, uh, number one, prioritizing based on phase of life. There's an overly simplified triangle where they say, you know, at every phase of life, you got two out of these three options. There's a triangle where you've got, you've got energy, is that battery icon. Uh, you've got time, that sand clock on the top, and then you've got money. And when you're in that learning phase, that first phase of life, you've got a bunch of energy, you've got a bunch of time, but you got no money. <laughs> and as you hone in on your skill sets and you learn more, you enter that building phase, career's on track, you have a family, uh, you've, got, you've got energy and money, but no time. And then you, then you retire, you got a little bit more of that enjoyment phase, you scale back uh, on the building phase, and you've got time, money, but limited energy. So the idea is to prioritize that missing element per phase of life. That's a little bit of an oversimplification, but um, how can you, how can you, the building phase is really the key that we see as financial advisors. We see a lot of people who sacrifice, 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 and then when they get to the enjoyment phase, something happens and they can't enjoy it in the way they had envisioned. But the building phase is really the one phase where you have the option to have all three. The learning phase, typically, uh, unless you've, you've been given a very great benefit from an outside source, you typically can't do much about not having money until you earn it. In the enjoyment phase, if something happens with your health and you don't have the energy, it's part of life. Building phase is typically where you have the ability to scale back either energy or money and enjoy a little bit of time. I'll leave this slide and we'll end optimism bias on what I think is one of the most interesting studies I've read in all of the academic literature I've reviewed. It's the Harvard study of adult development. It's actually the longest running study on happiness since 1938, 84 years. Uh, they had 724 participants, including JFK, who was a participant of this. Um, and they track people throughout their lifetime and they asked, and it's still going on, there's still a handful of remaining participants. And, they track um, what people are doing in their life and their self-reported levels of happiness. The longest run experiment on happiness, two key variables came up. Um, number one, people learned later in life to let go of trivial matters that would have stressed them in the past that they found the wisdom and learning shouldn't stress them in the present. Most importantly, uh, staying connected. And this is what relates to optimism bias and us not prioritizing relationships. The, one of the single greatest factors in predicting their longevity and self-reported happiness was how connected they were with friends and family, prioritizing those relationships. Mission Wolf had the pleasure of welcoming Dan, Dan Butner, who did the Blue Zones of longevity, areas with the longest longevity on the planet. And one of the elements of human longevity was um, staying connected socially. So this is a little reminder that the optimism bias tells us we will always have a little bit more time in the future to spend with family. We will always have next year to uh, take that vacation or visit our, our beloved friend. And sometimes that's not the case. It's prioritizing those, those relationships not only has health benefit to it, uh, but we know, um, we know can help curb some of the traditional uh, roadblocks with different phases of life. Yeah, Joe, the, the, the let go is an interesting one. I'm, I'm experiencing that now with my father-in-law who's having health issues. Um, and, and it's interesting. He's, he's had in, things that bothered him pretty, fairly easily throughout most of his life. And now he'll just say just, he doesn't, it doesn't bother him. It's really weird. He's a completely different person. Yeah. He, he would have been happier in life if he would have let a lot of the things go that bothered him years and years and years ago. As the first, the first factor that was, this is a self-reported study. So, you know, you ask open-ended questions and you get people to give you the feedback and across the participants, that was one of the ones that came up, just learning to let go. Um, anyways.
keeping it going. A little bit more of a technical one, making decisions within a group is number two uh, for our chat bandwagon effect. And we've heard about this. Uh, this is a, a more of one of the well-known ones. We tend to adopt certain behaviors or beliefs because other people do the same. And you can see in the, in the matrix up top, it's really connected to a whole bunch of areas of, of financial life and beyond. Biggest issue that we see is actually with buying and selling positions. So over the last 30 years, we really had the largest economic boom in the history of, of the planet. And we had, everybody had a chance to be a multimillionaire, but a few did. So I'll draw your attention to this chart below the Dalbar study. Over the past 30 years, 1992 to 2001, and 1992 feels a lot more recent than, than 30 years ago, but you can see the average investor earned 709K. If you had just left the money in the S&P 500, you just you, you, you put, put 100,000 in in 1992 and you just let it sit there, uh, you would have had to have gone through the dot-com bust, the mortgage crisis in 08, COVID, and all of the news articles in between different presidents, you name it. If you just let it sit there, it would have ended up with almost $2.1 million. So what's left on the table, this gap between 790,000 and $2.1 million, uh, that's the human element. That's us getting in our own way. And we can actually see this quantitatively up at the chart above. The, the blue line that you see zigging and zagging is the performance of, of the world equity market. So all, in general across the world. And then the, the green bars you see are whether or not people bought in or sold over the course of from 2003 and onwards. So I've highlighted a few areas that I think are really interesting just to really drive this point home. I, I'll show you 2008, which are these two highlighted bars here. When the market's plummeting, you can see a lot of people are selling. But notice right here at the tip, of where the market starts to recover. When it starts to go back up, people are still selling. And then through all of the recovery, 2009, very few people are buying. The fund flows are, are not many people are buying in. The, these differences, people getting afraid and, and acting as a herd, um, these are what cause the difference between having a potential 2.1 million versus ending up with, with 800,000. We've really seen this over the last two years, um, especially with COVID, with COVID hits and there's a lot of bad headlines that are coming up uh, after it and people are fearful. So they sell and we're getting a lot of fear-based selling in the markets, even though the markets have gone up. Yes, they've come down a little bit this year, but in general, still strong performance. This type of behavior is what we see happen very often to, to reduce the amount of earnings potential that typical investors have. And this is what we're trying to avoid with the behavioral finance conversations. So a couple of potential solutions here. Number one, there's something called the greater fool theory, which is when you, you are trying, you're buying something because you think you can sell it at a higher price in the future. That's the only reason why you're buying it. And the idea is if, when it gets to that higher price, if you're willing to sell it, you think it's at the highest price. So why would somebody buy it from you if it's at the highest price? You're, you're betting as if they're a bigger fool than you are because they're willing to buy it at a price you're ready to sell at. Uh, so just buying something speculatively for a higher price later on, uh, it, that's not investing, that's speculation. We see a lot of that with, with cryptocurrencies recently to swept the headlines. Purchasing assets that produce value, diversified, have long-term convictions, those, that's really the sound strategy to, to take. And then sticking with it through the long time, knowing that um, short-term noise will not distract from a long-term approach if you have a solid foundation and understanding in place. Issue number two, there's only two for bandwagon effect. Brad, any comments on, on the last one before I move over? No, no, there is, there's a question about, but I think we'll probably hand it, handle it at the end on how do we deal with financial risks that were from the slides before, but we'll, we'll hit that on the end. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that's actually gonna, it'll, it'll be coming up in a couple of slides. Great question. For the bandwagon effect, one of the items, this actually caught me by surprise. So as a financial advisor, right, we're trained and we've got all this special knowledge about depth, but I would have clients call me up and say, you know, the S&P 500 is down 20%, I'm, I'm scared, what's going on? And I would explain what's going on in the markets, but 
it took me a couple of years to realize, hold on a second, let me, let me explain one critical detail. You only have 10% of your portfolio in the S&P 500. So even though it's gone down 20%, that piece in what you own has only gone down two. And that caused a lot of people a lot of ease. And I realized it's really rare that we scale the fear for the magnitude that we're exposed to it. So we see a lot of fear going around and we use that as justification for having fear ourselves. The telltale sign of this, by the way, is you'll see countless headlines that say, worst blank since insert year. You know, worst inflation since blank, worst headwind since blank. And, and that, that headline is meant to draw people in, but they're not explaining that if you look out beyond that time horizon, things are still looking okay. So the potential solution here for avoiding the bandwagon effect when it comes to risk tolerance is understanding how to scale that risk for, for your applicable scenario. Someone invested 100% in the US S&P 500 does not fear the news of a decline 10 times more than somebody with only 10% in it. We kind of fear the news equally, even though one person has 10 times more exposure than the other. So keeping a little bit of a level-headed about, keeping a level-headed approach about what risk applies to you and in what magnitude goes a long way. Uh, and it certainly took me a lot, to me it seemed so self-evident because we're just, we've got our narrow focus on in our field that it wasn't until I started bringing this up and hearing how relieving it was that I realized I should probably make a point of this. <laughs> we, we see this, we see this a lot. And it, it's, it's interesting because when you started doing this work and, and how these, I call it like the brain mapping and these things were interconnected, the whole, the whole key to this um, is, is to create a sense of calmness and to have less stress because emotional decisions when it comes to financial matters typically don't turn out very well. And so really the, the purpose of the study is for us to understand what, what the emotional triggers are and then to understand how we're wired and to just respond to them in a more reasonable way. Now, we may get to the same end conclusion that we want to do a certain action, but at least we should do it with the full knowledge that it's the right thing to do versus it's something that my gut or my mind is racing that's making me do it that may or may not be to my best interest. And in, from the slide before, in general, society does not do things the right way. And this comes back to this whole Wall Street versus Main Street situation that's been in the news for the last five, six, seven years on how the wealthy get wealthier and the average day the average person doesn't and they're not catching up. And the one reason is, is on this particular slide and it's really on the asset flows. That's probably the biggest thing for people chasing when they shouldn't chase. On that note, I was about to gloss over it, but we, we do include this when we talk about investments. You can look at what causes, you can take a return and break it up into pieces, why you got said return. And what we found is that there are studies on this, ample studies, 92% of your return is determined by how you're invested, what portion of your assets are invested where. 5% is on whether or not you picked good investment choices within that allocation. So, so asset allocation is, I've got X percent in stocks and X percent in bonds, or X percent in international stocks and X percent in domestic. Getting that mix right, that recipe for the meal, that's what's going to determine the flavor of the dish. The investment selection piece, which is 5%, it's almost like you're, 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 cooking up, you're cooking up dinner and you're going to the grocery store and you're looking at the best stem of broccoli to pick to cook your meal. Well, if, you, if, if you've overcooked the broccoli, it doesn't matter if you pick the best broccoli in the grocery store, you've overcooked it. So investment selection is picking that best choice within each of the investment securities, but really 92% is determined by how you're invested within the portfolio, broadly speaking. 2% is timing, and that's where everybody's attention goes, which is surprising to us practitioners because everybody will call and say, what's happening? Interest rates are rising, what should we do? Well, 
we don't wait until it's raining to buy an umbrella. You, you buy an umbrella on a sunny day knowing that rain may come in the future. So you build a portfolio to withstand long-term tests of time and you don't make knee-jerk reactions for timing. Studies show it's only 2% of your, of your um, returns. There's a story here that I once worked with one of the largest advisors in Florida. And he said, uh, he gave me a story. He said, you know, I'm going to give you an example that he calls, the, he calls it the mother-in-law portfolio. So forgive me if the joke is in bad taste. It's not my joke. But he says, imagine if you, you have, you're investing money for your mother and you're investing money for your mother-in-law. And let's just say for whatever reason, you really, you're, you're, you're not a fan of your mother-in-law. And you have perfect know-how of what the markets are going to do. And you're going you're gonna to buy your own mother's portfolio when the market's at its lowest, right before it recovers. And you're going to buy your mother-in-law's portfolio at the top, right before it tumbles. But then you're not going to do anything. You're just going to let them sit. And he said, you know what the difference would be in their total return after 10, 20 years? The timing is not going to matter long term. Uh, two percent of the two percent. It's not he he got it wrong. It's not zero, but there's a two percent difference there. <laughs> so it's really small. And then other things like fees and, and and we won't get into that. But just the highlight here is timing is really not where we should be focusing our attention. We should be focusing our attention on ninety two percent of what determines our returns, how we are invested, not not what we're doing on any given day or week or month. Though though the world doesn't support that, right? So. Financial news channels, print, online, constant feeds. It's it's usually fear and greed oriented, which gets into timing and selection, because the other part is is boring. It works, but it doesn't attract eyeballs. But you really should be spending that 92% on the 92%. And it's it's difficult, but to block out the noise of the other part. That's the part that's most stressful and distracting and causes actually the most problems. Lisa asked a really good question. Doesn't the allocation change depending on our age? And absolutely, that's what people like Brad and I are here for is to pick an allocation that fits your exact life and change it over time, so depending on your change in needs, what you need from the, from the allocation. That's where we focus our time and energy because that's what's proven to matter most. But, but Main Street, unfortunately, is, is, is lured in for all the reasons Brad just commented on to focusing on the timing, which is how they get it wrong, which is how we see a big difference between, between public growth of wealth and, and, and you know, institutional growth of wealth. I want to go over, this is probably the most interconnected one, anchoring. I think anchoring applies literally anytime you look at any number anywhere, anchoring is applying. So it's really rooted in daily life. And, and anchoring's idea that when we make estimates about something or when we think about any sort of value, we tend to, we get new information and we have a baseline. We have a number that we think of as a starting point, an anchor, and we adjust up or down from that anchor. The most obvious example here is when you go to a department store and they say, original retail price, you know, $10,000, our price, $50. <laughs> You're looking at it going, ah, I know it's not that expensive retail. That price that they're putting on there is an anchor. They want you to feel like you're getting a deal. So they show you a higher price first and then a reduced price afterwards. So anchoring applies. Uh, it's one of the most connected nodes of the entire matrix. And we certainly don't have enough that we could, we could do a whole topic on anchoring alone. But we're just going to touch on a couple of the ones that we see uh, applying. The first is evaluating performance. When, when markets move dramatically, um, for whatever reason, it is the norm for us to compare performance to arbitrary anchors like January 1st or the prior all-time high. But doing that sets us up for failure because that sets us up to focus on the short term and it sets us up to compare where we are today to the prior highest period in the past. So we're, we're constantly in a state of anxiety because anytime we go beneath one of those two arbitrary anchors, we feel like things are bad. Potential solutions are really zooming out and anchoring to a long-term perspective. So there's, there's a lot of numbers on the next slide, but of all of my reading, the next slide, in many of my opinions, is the most powerful slides of, of data that I've seen as a financial advisor. The takeaway is already written on this slide. Historically speaking, there was a 99.81% chance 
of having a positive return in any six year period and a 100% chance of a positive return in any 12 year period. So that's US stocks, 1972 to 1922. Let me show you what this looks like. And the idea is I'm trying to anchor the group to longer term performance um, measures. So I warned you, a lot of numbers, and, and Brad already warned you that I'm a nerd at the start of the call. But what we see, I'm gonna draw your attention to the left-hand side, all these various bars. And what this data shows is the best and the worst returns from the last 50 years on a one-year time period, which is that first bar, on a two-year time period, and it goes all the way down to 20 years. So an example of a, of a three-year period, let's say you're looking at 2010 to 2020, you look at a chunk of time that's 2010 to 2013, and then 2011 to 2014, 2012 to 2015, and so on and so forth. And you can start to see how that gets narrowed. So when we look at one year over the last 50 years, the worst one year period, you can see in the red numbers to the right, was March 2008 to February 2009, negative 43%. The best one year period was actually July 1982 to July 1983 to June 1983 plus 66.73%. If you look at all of the periods of one year going back 50 years, there was 21% of the time you had a negative year. It's pretty good odds though. That means that four fifths out of time you had positive years. But as you increase that duration, you start to see how much smaller your chance of negative returns are in a longer time period. Six-year returns, this is, the, this is the, the most telling of them. If you look at any six-year period the, over the last 50 years, the worst six-year period was January 2000 through December 2005. You had negative 0.12% uh, return. The best six-year period, 23.62% uh, annualized from April 1994 to, to March 2000. So what I'm trying to do is show the group that in, we spend all of our time focusing on this first bar, this one year, where we look at, we anchor to January 1st, or we anchor to the same time period last year, or we anchor to the highest market, market value. When in reality, if we're looking at things from a five-year perspective or from a 10-year perspective, the data is not gonna look as emotionally charged as it is when we look at it in short time periods. Most telling over the last 50 years, there were, were no negative periods that exceeded 12 years. There was a 0% chance you could have lost money if you stayed in the market for 12 years or more uh, over the last 50 years, historically speaking. So I'm trying to anchor to a long term, but I also want to anchor to risk tolerance. Risk tolerance, there, there's an interesting question that was asked in one of the behavioral papers that I read. Imagine you've got somebody who has $5 million and they experience a 10% loss. So they're at $4.5 million at the end of the year versus somebody who's got $500,000 and they experience a 50% gain they end the year at 750,000. Who's happier? We'd, we'd like to imagine it's the person with $4.5 million, but we all know who's happier. It's the person who's ending the year with 750,000. But that's a little counterintuitive, right? How is the person with less money happier than the person who's ending the year at 4.5 million? This is that difference between traditional economics and behavioral economics. Traditional economics says, doesn't matter what happened with the movement, the person with more should be happier. Behavioral economics says, no, no, no. What matters is people, uh, people adjust based on an anchoring point and going up or down is what they emotionally feel. So that's why we know the person who ends the year with 750,000 is gonna feel better, even though they have less than the guy who ended at 4.5 million. So what I like to do with clients when I first meet them to talk about investments is I do like to anchor them to a normal range of risk. And we do this at Mission Wealth. This is, uh, I, I stole this chart from our internal files, but everybody on this call can actually take a look at this chart and find two numbers to jot down that'll give them goalposts to stay within. So what the chart shows is actually the normal range of movement in any given year based on how somebody's invested. So typically a lot of people are invested 60% in equities and stocks and 40% in bonds or fixed income. It's a very standard allocation. Sometimes you go a little bit more conservative and you have less stock and more bonds. Sometimes you go a little bit more aggressive, but most people generally know where along this spectrum they're roughly invested. 
And I tell clients all the time, these highlighted numbers here, these, these, the, the third and second from the bottom rows, those two numbers represent the range of normal movement that your portfolio can have in any given year. So if you've got, a, this is historically speaking, of course, but if you've got a portfolio that's 60% stocks and 40% bonds, your normal range of movement in any given year is plus 30.8% or minus 13.5%. So if you call up and you say, we're at negative 10%, is the sky falling? The answer would be no. You're perfectly well within normal. So the idea of having a range of normal and, and, and making those your anchors will avoid the short-term thinking. If you're down within a range that's normal, you, you can go to sleep at night knowing that's what you signed up for. You have transparency. So it would be fun for on this slide for people to take a peek at how they're generally invested and jot down their two numbers of normal movement. And this is for, this is for our portfolios. So you know non-mission wealth clients may differ, but um, it's a good ballpark estimate to show uh, what, what a normal range of movement would be. And, second, and, I, think, and, I, and I think a good point here is, is also um, put another layer on here for emotional stress. Individual stocks are generally two to three times riskier than the market itself. As soon as you own 30 to 35 stocks, you basically then own the market. So if you're looking at this for yourself, individual stocks, they're going to, they'll be all over the place. If you look at them as a bunch, then they should come into the, into these factors. If it's concentrated, it's going to be much higher or much lower. I always point out this second from the bottom row, or even the last row, which is the maximum drawdown. And I say, look, this is the number that if we, if we had another 2008, that last row is the number that your portfolio is going to, going to hit more or less. How does that make you feel? Are you going to be are you going to be losing sleep at night? Because our job as financial advisors and, and, and investors is not only to make sure that your assets support your goals, but we also really want it to be emotionally stable for you. In fact, we know that one of the largest detriments to your success is if it gets too emotional. So uh, having these numbers in mind, I, I often start at that emotional place and say. What's the minimum we need your assets to grow to sustain you? And that's going to determine what our minimum is, but we don't need to get greedy. What's the level of pain that you can comfortably tolerate? And let's discuss that before we invest a single dollar. That way, when, when things go south, because if you're investing for multiple years, it's not a question of if things are going to go down. It's just a question of when. Yeah, you play the long game, things will go up and down like flipping a coin, heads or tails. But but over the long term, we know what's going to happen. You flip the coin enough, and it's going to be 50-50 heads, tails. So we start with the emotional side. We start with the risk. Um, and it's fun to anchor between these two, these two goalposts because that gives you an idea of what normal risk is. Um, Lisa, you asked a question about how do we know uh, how much we have, how much room we have for financial risk. That's really bullet point number two here, which is know your maximum drawdown in dollars. You're going to need it's a little bit of a technical solution here. Financial planning software can help model this, but one of the items that I like to do with clients is to, to have a hypothetical scenario where I vacuum out X dollars that they have working for them. And I say, you know, what if you what if you had a million dollars less? Could could you could you continue living with the lifestyle you're currently living? And if not, we find what the number is. Your maximum drawdown, you you could lose. X thousands of dollars before you're really in jeopardy. Having that in mind can provide peace of mind because typically speaking, if the market's going down, but it's not coming as close to the maximum amount you could lose, then you know that you're okay. You have that in the back of your mind. You're anchoring to, you're anchoring to three values. The first two values are what normal movement is. These two values highlighted below in the chart. And then the third value is you're anchoring to the maximum amount in dollars that you could lose without being in jeopardy. Having those three numbers in mind are a really good defense mechanism for stomaching market movements. Because unless you're dealing with a market movement that goes beyond those three numbers, you don't need to worry. And, and I think another place on the behavioral side that gets people through it is a key is cash flow. And we now that interest rates are higher, there, there's more cash flow available in the marketplace. Um, Sort of like if you, if you have an apartment building and the rents come in, 
we do a weird thing with with equities that they're priced every second of the day, right? But if we have an apartment house, we don't reprice the apartment house every second of the day. And so we know these things go up and down. Inflation over time tends to push asset levels up higher. But if you can get it so that the portfolio in your in your question, Lisa, kicks off enough income that you don't need to touch principal, then it helps people sleep well at night and they do better over time because they don't have to make emotional decisions or forced into them, or they're not forced to sell assets. So that's key, which gets down to sort of the risk issues of behavioral finance and getting back to the allocation versus the individual security level. Press on time, framing is a good one, but I'm gonna actually jump forward. So the status quo bias is, is, you know, we typically don't like change. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. We set these default choices and we repeatedly make them to form habits uh, that eliminate the cost and time of making a new decision. So it's really at the base of habit formation. And the number one issue we see is saving money. People save what's left after expenses instead of paying themselves first. Uh, this is why credit cards, every loan provider on the planet has an auto pay option. This is why, because an auto pay option is a status quo bias option. It's the default choice that'll keep happening unless you choose otherwise. But we can reverse engineer this to work in our favor. So uh, economists, my favorite, as a nerd, I have a favorite economist. His name is Richard Thaler. And he, um, he found that there are four ways to quadruple your savings rate. You make, some, you make a savings mechanism very, very available, easy. You have automatic enrollment. So this is something, you know, you get paid, you move funds directly into an investment account. Or during retirement, you have an automatic cash flow that comes out of your retirement accounts and into your bank account, puts you at mine. You've, you've got your income. You've got automatic investments. You, you, cash goes in and they're put to work automatically. And then lastly, you've got automatic escalation. As you earn more, the savings amount goes up with it. So if, if you've got colleagues or yourself or family, this is particularly important to younger people who haven't figured out how to save money yet, automating it, making it a default choice that'll keep happening, gets the status quo bias working in your favor. What's really and especially, mm -hmm. and especially for people on this call with, with children, grandchildren that are in their working, especially early working years, there is no reason for these folks investing a little bit of money can't be extremely wealthy in retirement. There's literally no reason in the tiniest amounts. It, it's just, it, it's shocking when you go back in history on the little amount of money, it's just time. It's time that helps so much in these issues. So if you can get the kids and the grandkids just to start automatically doing this stuff, it's gonna make their life so much better down the road. Let me chat about how this applies to the non-financial realm, because I think this could help um, give you a lot to think about as we end the call. I want to end on a little bit of artwork, but also just talk about how we think the status quo bias relates to the non-financial element. So again, status quo bias, we keep things the same. We, we've, we streamline our decision process and we make our habits. So we see this apply to the physical component of our wealth, our careers, what we think of as fun and the social element. There's a, a psychologist who found that we make up approximately 40% of our waking hours by habits. So we go to the same restaurant when we're feeling for the same type of cuisine. And when we go there, we eat the same dish that we know we like. Or when we walk the dog, we walk on the same exact path every time. When we call family members, we call for the same reasons every year, a birthday or the holidays. We make the same decisions because we're creatures of habit. We buy the same brands. We eat at the same place for lunch every day. Uh, we work in the same career, whether or not it's a good fit for us. We stay in the roads we built for ourselves and that can cause regret later on. So the potential solution that I wanted to leave everybody on for the day is thinking of ways to challenge yourself for daily habits that you've built up. Think about the things you do every day or every week. And if there's a new way you could do those things and starting small, is there a new path you could drive uh, when you go to work? Is there a new road you could walk on with the dog? Can you call up a family member or somebody you're thinking of just to say, hey, 
I've been thinking about you. I love you. I just want to say hello. And I don't want to wait until your birthday to give you a call. What are some of the ways we can challenge our status quo bias outside of the financial realm? And one of the things we do in our household that I'll share with the group is called happy nothing days. We, we will frequently, one of us will come home with something to brighten up the other's day for no reason whatsoever, just to break the status quo bias. Come, you walk in the door, I was buying groceries and I saw a nice bouquet of flowers or ah, you said you liked that thing last month and I picked it up. Or even, hey, let's go, let's go for a walk today, even though we normally do that on our weekend. Whatever it is, shaking things up, challenging the status quo bias, not only applies to the investments, uh, but it really does apply to the 40% of our waking hours that are determined by habits. There's a little bit of artwork on the side that I found uh, I thought would be interesting. Multiple ways to, say, to see the same truth. And then we've got this little sheet with a hole cut out of it for biases and our perceptions there at the end. So a little bit of our work, a little bit more of a lighter note on the ending. You hit on a lot of these biases. The, the thing that I find that's most interesting in this work, and we hit on the five and kind of went down, but it's the, it's the web that you, that you have with all the interconnections. It's, and, and you see it with people making decisions where multiple aspects of their lives intersect and people get stuck. Like estate planning is a big one. Estate planning will oftentimes take people months to sometimes years to do. And I, I in the old days, I couldn't really figure it out. And, and then you start looking at it and you look at this work and, and what's happened. You have to make investment decisions, you have to make family legacy decisions, you have to make tax decisions, you have to make gifting decisions, you have to make control decisions. There's a lot of decisions that have to be made in there. And once you start that web, which intersects a number of different things, people oftentimes just get shut down and they can't make a decision, which is a decision onto itself. So what I like about the work that you're doing is, is it allows us to just step back and say, What's going on and how are we as humans naturally wired and not making a judgment, just how do we deal with this? How do we know that we run into a stressful situation, identify the, really the issue behind it, and then you've identified some potential solutions to work through. And, and I, I find that to be fascinating. And I know that's not, that's work that's, I haven't seen anywhere. So I appreciate you spending all the time doing this. And I look forward to the papers that you will continuously write. Alisa, question on your end? Would you remind us of the names of your favorite spending tracking tools or financial management tools for mere mortals who aren't CPAs? And mainly, how can I do a better job of automating my spending to budget? And, you know, just automating that as much as possible, because as I age, you know, I don't have as much mental, physical energy. It's got to be more automatic, but I want to know you know, when a particular category is, is, is beyond my, you know, a really good kind of automated spending tracker to tracking my, a tool that tracks my spending to budget and lets me know where I'm screwing up or where I'm doing well. Yeah, absolutely. There's a lot of tools out there and, and the answer is really stemming in technology, right? We're leveraging technology to help automate these processes for us. So my, my biggest piece of advice for most people is sign into your bank on your laptop or your computer and just see what offers, what services they offer that's included to track your spending. Most over the last three to five years have built out their, their whole suite of tracking and budgeting tools. And, and it doesn't mean you have to download or pay for a new software. There is a software I use that tracks things on spreadsheets called uh, Tiller HQ. And that's a little bit more hands-on, but it is automated. It connects to your financial accounts and brings in your transactions and it can alert you via email whenever you're over uh, a category expense that you've, uh, that, you, that you've set for yourself, a limit you've set for yourself. Some credit cards do offer um, alerts based on category, but, uh, but they're usually not as sophisticated as something like a full you know, suite. In general, automating is the key when it comes to um, saving and, and, and not necessarily spending, but saving, right? Automate your savings. If you have income coming in and you're in saving mode, have a piece of that income go out to your savings accounts 
whether those are investment accounts or your bank accounts, have them go out automatically on the same time the money comes in and pay yourself first. That was the biggest contributing factor to people being able to save more and automating that. So you have a, you have an automatic sweep from your, whatever account you, you get income in, have the money go to your savings account on the same day and you just automate it. So you don't have to go in there and do it yourself every time. Yeah. Another, the, uh, the year end Amex and Visa, they, they generally have a really good year end um, statement that breaks down everything monthly and then it breaks it into categories, which I find is, is really helpful. And then you just cross check that versus, versus the bank cash in and cash out and you can get a number relatively quickly. When Joey, what, what are some of the stresses that happen for folks where, where Lisa wants to track these things, but if they're not being tracked and people are just making assumptions, how, how do our brains deal with making assumptions and spending or risk our markets, what are, what are the natural tendencies that happen? The biggest one is optimism bias. We, we really underestimate how much we spend and we overestimate how much we can save. And there are really easy ways to check whether or not we are biased with optimism bias. So actually, here is the easiest way to check. And this is what I did for years before I got a more sophisticated tracking method. You, you level off your bank, whatever account you spend out of, you level that off every month, let's say $10,000, whatever it is. You have enough in that account to make sure there's no amount of money that'll come in and out per month that'll jeopardize that level. And if you've got money coming in and money coming out, at the end of the month, you can see where you are relative to where it started. So the only thing you need to remember to do 12 times a year, which takes two seconds, is to level off the account at the start of the month. So if I start off at, at 10,000 in, in, in an account that I spend out of, money comes in, money comes out, and I end the month at 9,000, I know that I spent $1,000 more than came in. Hmm. If, I, if I end at $11,000, I know that I spent, I, I spent $1,000 less than came in. That's a really easy way, and, and it's a pretty low resolution way of tracking your spending, whether it'll tell you whether or not you're over or underspending, and it'll tell you by how much. It won't tell you what you're overspending in, but it's a good uh, low effort way of figuring out if you're over or underspending and by how much. That's the easiest way. Then to use, to, to use a software that can bring in other financial accounts, there's a couple, the two biggest ones are Mint and then Tiller is the one I told you about. These are softwares that bring in, uh, they connect to all of your financial accounts in your life and they, they bring in the data and they can tell you how everything is connected. They can tell you the transactions. They're, they're not perfectly automated. There's a little bit of a learning curve because you've got to figure out how to tinker with them and maybe you get something wrong here or there, but they get 90% of the job done and make it a lot easier for you to understand your spending. There are a couple of questions here. One from Danelle. Um, mm -hmm. would like to learn more on the topic and is seeking some recommendations for books and podcasts and other resources. Yeah, thank you, Danelle. There's two books. Uh, I mentioned my favorite economist, Richard Thaler, and I can put that in here. He actually invented behavioral economics. Um, there's, there's a book by him called uh, Nudge, N-U-D-G-E, and that's a practical guide to implementing nudges in your daily life. And it's really, really wonderful to think about how you can uh, include some of these items in daily life. The audible for it is, is a breeze. Um, he has another book that's a little bit more lengthy, but equally, uh, equally exciting called Misbehaving, aptly named <laughs> for behavioral economics, uh, Misbehaving. Which is uh, which is really good, and again, I'd recommend the Audible. Uh, it's it's a it's it's he's one of the few economists that writes in a way for non economists, which I love. He's got a dry sense of humor that's fun to listen to, but he's not going to burden uh, the writing with a bunch of mathematics or theory or formulas. It's it's really just applied lessons. So Richard Thaler would be the best resource for getting your feet wet in this in, in this field. We do have another question here from someone about to see if this is a good time, bad time, what to do to uh, add to your portfolio. Well, JD, thank you for the question. This is actually a 
perfect segue into the slide that I skipped, if I may. Um, let me jump over there and it leans right over to what we were chatting about. Let me jump in here. So we were talking about status quo bias. We make the same decisions repeatedly. We form these habits. Um, and, and I said, you know, we, we kind of live by the, if it ain't broke, don't fix it mantra. The opposite is true that when something feels broken, we try to fix it because it hurts and it relates to holding cash. This was issue number two that we didn't get to, uh, which is moving the cash. So in times like this, when markets are down, we get a lot of calls that say it hurts. I want to, I want to move the cash. Um, and JD's question was, if we've got extra cash, what do we do with it in times like this? I'll focus your attention on the middle three charts of this analytic we've got here. I've, I've highlighted it. These are uh, the market returns after there's a 20% decline in the US stock market. So this year we've had a 20% decline. And the three charts from left to right are the average one-year returns the average two-year returns, and the average five-year returns. These are cumulative, so they're just adding up all of the returns. And the biggest takeaway is the, this, this is going back to 1926, so we've got plenty of data in this uh, analytic. The average cumulative five-year return when the markets pull back 20% is plus 71.8%. Uh, I can't think of a better tagline to convince people that when the markets pull back, it's a good time to, to buy. It's similar to, I like to explain this as a department store. Imagine if you're walking down the street and your favorite department store puts a sign out front that says, come inside, everything 30% more expensive, sale ends tomorrow. You're not gonna go inside. You're gonna wait until tomorrow when the 30% more expensive sale ends, right? But on the other end, if you walk in and you see a sign that says, everything inside 20% off, you're gonna say, oh, maybe I do need a new shirt or maybe I need a new you know, pair of pants. And you're gonna go inside and you're gonna start hunting for a good deal. It's similar with the markets. A lot of people get excited. It goes again to the bandwagon effect. If I can scroll up there and show you those bars. When things are really, really high right here, things start to get really, really high, people buy in. That's what we saw here right before the 2008 crash. People buy in, they get excited. So that's like buying in when a, when a store says they've got a sign of 30% more expensive inside. On the flip side, when things are down, uh, you, you really have a compelling reason to deploy the cash um, and, and buy into more favorable pricing. That being said, I do think cash is a good tool. Having, you know, at least the, the typical market downturn is 14 months, right? So. Do I, do I suggest having 14 months of cash? It depends if your financial plan can afford it or not, but having some level of cash on the sideline so that you don't have to worry about the market is a very useful psychological tool. Moving all to cash is a horrible decision, but having some cash where you say, I don't need to sweat about this for six months or a year, that can provide you with a lot of peace of mind in the event that your plan doesn't need for all the assets to be working all the time. So I, I see Lisa has a follow-up question. I guess it's it's more about like, well, where would you put it today? So, I mean, the easy question for that is you'd say, all right, what's the time horizon? And then the longer the time horizon, the pecking order in traditional economics, smaller companies do better than larger companies. The U.S. and the international, in theory, should do relatively the same, though it hasn't for a very long period of time. If you're looking for, for value, the international side is cheaper than the U.S. still, though the U.S. has become less expensive. And another bias is, is home bias. Every country sees this. U.S. investors predominantly invest more in the U.S. than any place else, which is interesting. Canada, Canadian citizens, invest more in Canadian companies than anything else in the entire world. Europe, the same way. The US is kind of interesting. Down in oil, oil territory, they'll buy more oil. The Pacific Northwest and the West will buy more tech. The East Coast will buy more financials. So there's even biases that happen within the United States. And it's really interesting as, as a national firm, 
it was a little bit easier for us to deal with the biases when we were headquartered in Santa Barbara and really dealing, dealing with Southern California for the most part. But then when we became national, it's like we run into all these territories with there's these different biases and sub biases within our entire country. So it's interesting in having to deal with these with these things. Actually, there's a name for that, right? Home bias. We what we're what we're familiar with and what's in our backyard we perceive as less risky. So so the Northeast heavy in financials, the Northwest heavy in tech. They see it day in and day out. They see the buildings as they drive to and from work. It's it, they 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 perceive it with less risk because it's more familiar and it's because it's close to home. The last item that we had was framing. This was the fifth of the five, the top concepts. And framing just means that we, we have a different perception based on the way identical information is presented to us. A good example here is, you know, if you've got, if you've got ice cream that says 20% fat free versus 80% fat, you're going to pick up the one that says 20% fat free, even though it's the same exact thing. So different data points, depending on what features are highlighted, uh, appeal to us in different ways. This really applies to risk tolerance. So for example, we get a lot of uh, worried concerns. We, we anchor to that January 1st, or we anchor to the market um, top. And when things go down, we worry, am I okay? The bottom right is actually an analytic we use in our firm. This is a, this is a, a real example you know, here's what we're worried about, this little highlighted area, that little dip recently. But the yellow line is what they put in, and the blue line is what they have. So they're still way over what they put in, but that little dip is what's causing all the anxiety. And that's what's going to keep us in at night. As we zoom out, and we widen that time horizon, we notice it's not as worrisome as we thought it would be. Um, it's just a short-term blip like the, the rest always have been. Well, we know this, which is particularly interesting. This is fascinating and a question that you could ask uh, uh, professionals you work with. We've learned that reordering the performance reports to show the longer time period first uh, helps clients deal with the risk of short-term movements. So this, this down here, it says, which feels better. You see, you know, investment gain inception today. It says, oh, you're up 300,000. But this year you're down 486. But 300,000 includes the drop you've had this year. And since you started working with us, you're still up 10%. This year you're off 17. That's okay. You say, oh, even with this year, I'm up 10%. I'm okay with that. I can stomach that. Versus you show the same exact information just in the other way around. You say, oh my goodness, this year you're down 487,000 and you're down 17%. And now blood pressure's up, you know, the, the heart's pounding. You're, I don't care what I hear next. That sounds horrible. You say, oh, but it's not that bad. Since inception, you're up X and, and Y. Our brains are wired to compare information based on what we've received before it and after it. So the order of the way we get information matters. And with framing, we've noticed two key solutions. One is really highlighting longer term performance first, instead of worrying about shorter term performance to the, to the extent that it is possible. And number two is, is focusing on a, on a time period, um, on a wider time period, which is the next slide, which I'll show you in a moment. Some of this you'll notice as you start to think about framing, you'll notice that it's almost as if the world, like if, if we had tried to build a situation where we would want uh, investors to be most subject to framing bias, we've, we've already done it. Like for example, when you sign into an investment account, what's the first, what's the first number you see? What today's markets have done or what your portfolio has done in, in, the, in the given month. It's almost as if we've, for whatever reason, people want to see the most recent information, but it's actually setting up a lot of investors on Main Street for failure because it's keeping the focus on the short term. It's framing your current good or bad state on what's happening now instead of what's happened over your investment career. So here's just a little graph to really show you and drive the point home. I think this is um, second to last one here, which is showing you the, the ratio of stock market growth to 10% downturns. And there's a lot of blue and not a lot of red. 
And it goes all the way back to 1926 here, showing you uh, every, every period in between the, the amount of political risks and war and um, interest rate, inflation rates, different Federal Reserve policies, everything's in, included here. It's almost 100 years of history. And it just zooms you out and says, OK, whatever ch chapter we're on right now, it's already been included in the book. Uh, things will be all right. We're just looking at it through a narrow frame. What we noticed with framing, this is, was not supposed to be the last point of the presentation, but in the order we went is, um, we really noticed framing on, on the inability to reduce taxes for a lot of investors. So I, I like to tell clients that they can think about, the losses can be thought about as good losses or bad losses. In the same way that nutritionists came up with good fats like avocados instead of you know, Halloween candy, in the spirit of it being October. Um, selling positions when they're at a loss can be a good thing if they're used to offset gains in the future. So I have this Coke and Pepsi little graphic below. And a lot of times it's difficult for us to understand what that means when an advisor tells you, we have good news. We realized $50,000 of losses for you. You kind of want to strangle them. You did what? There's how many losses? It doesn't sound like a good thing, but in reality, uh, they really can be. So the example I use is, imagine you buy Coca-Cola at $100 a share, and it goes down to $80 a share, and you do nothing. You, you love Coca-Cola. It's your favorite dinnertime drink, um, like Warren Buffett. <laughs> and, and you do nothing, and it goes back up to $100 a share. That's fine. You're, you're neutral. You're made even. Um, and you own Coca-Cola, and that's that. Whereas, you can imagine a second scenario. Coca-Cola goes from $100 a share to 80 and you sell it. And you realize a $20 loss. And you buy Pepsi, because Pepsi is going to move in the same way as Coca-Cola in the markets, because they're very similar. They're sister products. Even though, personally, I would tell you they're very different. Coca-Cola is definitely better. But for the example's sake, <laughs> we'll go with Pepsi. You buy Pepsi at 80 and you ride it back up to 100 or you, you wait out a period until you can buy Coca-Cola again. And then you're back to 100, so you haven't lost any money, but you now have a $20 loss that you can use to offset taxes later on. And those that loss never expires. You can roll it forward every year. In that case, it's a good loss to have gathered. So when the markets are down like they are this year, going in there and trading positions that are at a loss and buying something identical to it uh, is a strategy called tax loss harvesting. And a lot of the times people struggle with that because from a framing perspective, realizing a loss sounds like a bad thing. It feels like you lost money out of your wallet, but in reality, you're staying fully invested and you're gathering a tax asset to, to keep your money working for you instead of going to Uncle Sam. So that's, that's what I can think of as a good loss. And you know, there are some bad losses, losses that can't be used to offset your tax bill, bad losses. But in general, uh, framing really prohibits clients from, from working with uh, realizing losses. Framing is also really, really applicable to managing concentrated stock. It's not in our presentation for today, but it's something we are uh, actively working on clients divesting concentrated stock in a down market. Framing is a really important tool for, for solving that issue, but um, we wanted to keep this presentation general enough to apply to most participants. I think you have made us feel very rich. Thank you. You really made us feel comfortable. You have given us an awful lot of knowledge, and I have never had a bad loss with my brand. <laughs> All my losses have been very, very good and hope to continue to have some more because the information, the assurance, the planning, the recognition of the need of each client and how to fulfill their needs has been a remarkable assistance, help and love for us. So we loved listening to you, Joey, because you have explained all the things that we need to know. We probably should do it again because you have given us an awful lot of information. But we are grateful for your return visit and please come back again and keep on educating us about all the good and the bad 
in the economic world that we need to know because our security depends on having what we need to have for education and survival and housing and grandkids and many, many dollars that thanks to Brent, we were able to give to charity. And so we thank you. And you're welcome, you're Eva. Thank you, Heidi. Appreciate everyone on the on the call. Um, it's been a, it's been a, uh, an enjoyment and heartfelt gratitude. Thank you. Come back. We'll do. Wonderful. Take care.